Welcome to the Wavingston Clergy Clatch, a weekly online Bible study discussing the upcoming Sunday readings. The conversation is led by the Rev. Sven Van Bars from Abingdon, the very Rev. Gary Barker from Kingston Parish, and myself, the Rev. Scott Parnell of Ware Episcopal Church. Good morning, Sven. Good morning, Gary, and welcome to our next installment of the Wabingston Clergy Clatch. Uh, this week, we're doing the readings for the second Sunday after the Epiphany for January 17th. And so uh, we'll be starting off with a reading from the first book of Samuel, then reading an excerpt from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and then finally concluding with a portion from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Gary, would you start us off, please? All right, this is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, almost the whole chapter. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill again against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that Ugh. <laughs> My eyes are as dim as, 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 as Eli's, I'm afraid here, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you 
And more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. That's it. I love teaching this passage when I was teaching in schools. Um, and every time I would, we would go on a field trip and we would go lay in whatever chapel or church that was adjoined to the school. And we would reenact this passage out. Mm -hmm. And so it was great. The kids loved it, um, particularly when I was uh, working at a middle school in Texas. Um, they would just sort of lay everywhere. They had no sort of perception of what was sacred or holy. And that was perfectly fine. That I actually had to wake a kid up who had been fallen asleep on the kneelers at the altar rail um, mm -hmm. that he seemed to be enjoying his afternoon siesta. Um, and so, but yeah, the, this was a great story because the kids were able to sort of be in church, but not be in church. They were allowed to do something different in this this imagery of Samuel just sort of laying there, like taking a nap next to God, hanging out in the temple, um, is so different than how we treat our church buildings today. Um, and that there's a, a, a sacredness in the intimacy that I think Samuel had with the temple at this time or with the tent of meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I too love this story for, for several reasons. The the I'm just going to identify with it. the repetition of you know something's going on go back to bed something's going on go back to bed um, sometimes around 3 a.m. my dog wakes up and hears something you know outside I don't care a flip about you know but he's I like Steinway go back to bed he's not listening for the word of God he's just aggravating me so but that sense of of getting up again but then also the um the guts and the honesty that it takes Samuel to share the words that he hears with Eli um, of being, of being, you know, the here, here's what it is. And it's not good news against you. And, and that's where it goes back to the very beginning words of this, that at that time, the word Lord is very rare. And so, uh, you know, living at a time when the, when the temporal leadership is corrupt, living at a time when, um, the, the, the presence of God was not being practiced well or known well, and yet you still had this very faithful remnant, Eli and, and Samuel and others trying um, to uphold things. And yet, so it's, it's, that, it's that part. I, I often hear this part that the, the very last verse, uh, verse uh, 19 and 20, reminds me of sort of the, the words you see at the end of the movie. And so it's like, you know, you have a, a movie that tells a story that says, oh, and by the way, these two people in the story, they were friends to their dying days. That, that last verse, like, and Sam, after this, you know, here's the movie, it's ended in, in the credits, and Samuel grew up and did all these things. And so it's sort of like just a nice continuation of, of what's yet to come and what's the rest of the story doesn't end, it keeps on going. Yeah, I, th I think about that idea that the, at the very beginning that, um, that the word of God is somehow rare in those days. And, and I don't think I'm wrong in thinking the word of God is not rare. Um, it's just that, that we don't pay attention very well sometimes. And, um, and that it's always encouraging to me that Samuel had, had to listen four times before he got got straight that he had to really listen. Um, and, um, you know, in my faithfulness, I so often will jump up to do something. Here I am. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but I've jumped up in the wrong direction and I'm talking to the wrong person. Um, and, and, I, and I haven't 
sat still long enough to hear what God is really asking for, um, uh, which is not just my thickness, but also sometimes I have just enough of an inkling that whatever God is asking of me is going to be really hard, mm -hmm. like having to say some really nasty stuff to Eli, um, mm -hmm. some challenging words. Um, and so it's an avoidance. Uh, and to have the faithfulness to, to sit in the, in the dark of the night and wait and, and, and not be distracted by some other voice. Um, it seems to me in many ways, the story of my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if memory serves, the Eli's boys were, Hophni and Phineas, I think, Phineas, Phineas, something like that. And I, I'm pretty sure that they were, um, they were priests of the Levite tradition as well, and that they were abusing the sacrifices that were being made. So um, the understanding is, is that the, the Levites, they were paid for their services and that they got to keep the meat of the animals that were brought for the sacrifices, right? So sure. someone has to go make their sin offering or whatever. They bring their cow, they slaughter the cow. They get to take some of the meat home, but then the priest that conducted the service, the ritual sacrifice also got to take some of the meat home. And that was their livelihood. Mm -hmm. and if I think that they were sort of abusing that privilege and were not doing it equitably in how it was done. I also think that perhaps there may have been um, some shenanigans that were going on with uh, some lady friends around the temple that the, the boys were doing and that Eli, Eli wasn't holding them accountable, saying, right. look, you can't do this, right? That, and that he did, but he sort of said, well, don't do this anymore and just sort of skipped over past it. And it, it makes me sort of reflect on how how does the integrity of the, the institution sort of survive something like this? Because it really seems to fall apart, right? Between this moment and when Solomon constructs the temple, I mean, it's looking probably close to a close to hundred years where this sort of temple worship falls into disarray. One, the Ark of the Covenant, God's sort of thrown on earth, actually gets stolen by the Philistines. Um, David, I mean, well, Saul, first of all, doesn't seem to do all the greatest things in the world, that he was qualified to be the king because he was the tallest person in the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that then David comes along, and David did a pretty good job, but David seems to perpetuate um, perhaps some of uh, Eli's son's illicit behaviors. And then it's Solomon that's fully into that, but he also constructs this great temple. Mm -hmm. And that how, how does the integrity of the temple, I mean, I use the word cult here, not because I think it's some like grape juice drinking organization, but the action of that cult group, how does it function and how do you reclaim some of this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and I think that this is, a question that is being posed to a lot of institutions here in America right now, from the political realm all the way to the religious realm, right? That how do we, we recognize that some of the things we've done in the past aren't good, how do we sort of recapture and regain some of the, the credibility that was once there but no longer is really afforded to us? Right. And that doesn't mean someone's got to die <laughs> like Eli did. I mean, Samuel obviously sort of resurrects it, but it requires Eli to get out of the way. And right. Eli seems to understand his role in it. He may not be happy about it, but he seems to sort of say, let it be done unto me according to thy word. Well, it's also the, the, the striking thing uh, with Eli is that he is open to hearing that the criticism and the truth being spoken to him. Um, I think so many times our, our, in our human agency, 
we're like, I don't want to hear the message. I, I want to, I want to shoot the messenger. And so I'm not open to hearing those things. So often, oftentimes um, individuals within the organization, the, the political group, the church group, the, whatever it is, are saying this isn't right. But the, but the leadership like, no, nah, we're, we're, we're good. We're, we're not going to listen to this. Um, and so I think the, the, the spirit of God moving in Eli being that, you know, it takes him a little while to hear that call, figure out what's going on with Samuel. But once he does, and then he hears the prophecy, and then he lives into the prophecy, um, it's it's a testament to, although he has all these failings of ignoring all the bad things his son are doing, and my recollection is the same as yours. Um, so we must have had the same teacher and <laughs> the same portion of what his sons are doing. Um, but it's, it's the fact that he doesn't say, Shh, shh, keep this quiet. <laughs> you know, no, let me tell you why I'm innocent. Let me tell you why I'm um, I'm not uh, deserving of this judgment. I mean, there seems to be a striking contrast between Eli, Samuel's behavior, Eli's behavior, and then uh, by comparison, Adam's behavior in the garden. Right? Mm -hmm. That Adam hid, said, "I don't want to hear it," and then once he did hear it, she made me do it. Right. <laughs> to Eli <laughs> saying, yeah. yeah, and then it was the snake, the talking yeah. snake that told me to do it, yeah. right? That Eli sort of owns it. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's the first step of the redemption is the owning of it. Mm -hmm. well, Eli obviously has enough of a relationship with God that he's figured out eventually that Samuel needs to go back and sit down and say, your servant listens. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, I can easily enough relate to, to Samuel's slowness to catch on and also to, to Eli's dimness and in the blur of life sometimes not doing everything that needs to be done and not, not getting everybody in line or doing something like, like, like Eli, um, um, yeah. You also you you had mentioned that you're taking your kids to to sleep in the church. It reminded me of of um, I I spent most of my uh, teenage years going to a Methodist church. It was this glorious sort of Gothic concrete Gothic uh, little church. It was a small congregation, not a very large church, but it had been designed originally to be this huge Methodist church. And um, so it, it was beautiful and, and uh, the youth group spent the night there one night and held vigil and said prayers. And uh, in those days, there was no adult present, amazingly, um, as I think about it now. But um, I, I think we, we were old enough uh, and had proven ourselves enough to, that they weren't too worried about us and we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but, um, but there was, I mean, we literally slept uh, in, in, in next to the Ark of the Covenant. And, um, uh, and, I, and I think in some way that was part of what made us trustworthy teenagers. <laughs> Um, you know, we we were able to be in the presence in a way, and trusted uh, by the adults of the church. Uh, that and and we grew closer to God that way. Well, good. Well, shall we uh, shift gears a little bit and move to yeah, Corinthians? Yes. There's going to be a very common thread, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Let's uh, hold on. Let's see. <laughs> this is from the first letter to the Corinthians, the sixth chapter. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were brought, bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Okay, who wants to take that first? Nothing like the chance to preach against fornication. Um, That's right. Uh, uh, but uh, um, in my quiet time, just this morning, as a matter of fact, I was reading about uh, that, that image uh, of being the living stones of the temple of God, um, which for me is, is easier for me to comprehend. I mean, a, a body is an amazing thing. That, that God should give us these bodies and that they are our temples that, that hold the image of God uh, or that are somehow part of the image of God. Um, uh, that, but also I love that image of, of being living stones in the temple that, that is not just me being the temple, it's us being the temple together. And, and that it's the relationships that build the arches and, and, and the glory of the, of the structure. Um, and that sense that um, right relationship is, is so fundamentally important. Um, being in love with your, your neighbor of all sorts and conditions is not just a nice thing, not the thing we're supposed to do, it's the thing that is life. When I, when I read this, I think about it, it, it pulls us back to the question of what does it mean to be free in Christ? Um, as baptized members, we are free from death. We are free from, from sin and damnation. Uh, we believe that theologically, and we try to live into that. Um, but then I think what Paul's trying to address is, yeah, you're free, um, but that freedom comes with a set of understandings of what your relationship is that you're referring to, Gary. Um, and so freedom in God is, is not freedom to, to do whatever's going to destroy me. Freedom in God is not free to do whatever's going to destroy others. Um, just because I'm, I'm free in that way doesn't give me the right to, to do these things. Freedom in God means that you are therefore tied to God in spirit. And, and in, that, in that tying, you're free in ways. So I think Paul's raising the questions with those in Corinth to say, yeah, just, just, because, you, just because the baptismal vows affirm that you're going to heaven doesn't mean that you can, <laughs> you can live this hedonistic lifestyle and, and have no regard for the community around you or for you know, the, the example you're making for others. Yeah, I mean, I'm appreciating the irony that we're not touching sex yet, <laughs> right, right? Right, and that, I mean, here we are doing the same thing that Eli was doing, right? We're we're not right. going to talk about sex with our kids. We're not going to tell them that you shouldn't be doing this, and that, I mean, particularly in our culture today, that says pretty much anything goes as long as you quote don't hurt anybody, right? That we're we're missing that maybe it does. Mm -hmm. Maybe this, this fornication, to use the word, I mean, sex outside of marriage, that maybe it does hurt people. We just don't see it. Mm -hmm. That it, 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 I mean, I think it, it will, it can tear people apart. It, they're sort of in their souls that if, that if that unitive act um, within a couple isn't honored, and it's sort of used frivolously, that it's, it's tough. Right, that it, it does do damage, it does so mistrust. And that, I mean, I think, so I actually got to go to Corinth uh, probably five or six years ago. And so you have this huge temple um, that's in incredibly good shape and that right by it was the brothel. Hmm. 
and that I mean they're right next to each other and that even even in Corinth itself they make the observation that there was some weird funky stuff going on in Corinth this is sort of like on the museum plaque of like these two things aren't where they were and that it's also believed um, sort of what they pointed to because I think they knew Christians would come and sort of look at Corinth because Paul was there, that they sort of point out where in Paul's era, what was going on and that there was this rise of Gnosticism coming up. And so it was all about the self. It was all about escape. And it had nothing to do with caring for anyone else but yourself right? This should sound familiar to all of us in our time of COVID, right? That I do what I want because I want to with no disregard um, for whatever. And it, I mean, not to, to sort of take some of the mask off here that Pilar and I don't worry about getting COVID because of our personal health. We don't want to get COVID because we don't want to lose daycare, <laughs> right? And that how all of this is so interconnected. I mean, our daughter's 18 months old. She doesn't wear a mask, right? The kids at daycare don't wear masks and that it's now not us or just our daughter, but it's also all of these other kids and then all of their parents and then all of their places of employment. And that it doesn't really matter what I think about wearing a mask, that who knows what their situation is, right? That I may have the luxury of working from home um, perfectly fine, but some of these other folks don't. And so we, we've got to be conscious of that. And I mean, I, I appreciate Paul pulling on sex as sort of this most intimate of relationships to say, let's go to the extreme. Let's cut out the middle ground and get to the nitty gritty and mm -hmm. say that you've got to think about how you use your relationships and that are you pretending a relationship is somewhere that it's really not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you honor God in this? Mm -hmm. And in what way is that relationship of customer and prostitute not honoring the person of the prostitute? A woman who's kept in economic condition where she needs to use her body in that way to earn a living. And so, you know, by by perpetuating that system, you're you're not only doing harm to yourself, but you're also you're doing harm to another person. So well, so I, I read a, an article uh, a few weeks ago that was a, I can't remember the woman's name, but she's uh, a porn star that is really nervous about Kamala Harris being vice president because apparently the vice president has quite a history of working against um, sex workers. And that mm -hmm. sort of what this, what delusion someone has to operate under to think this is good yeah right and that how tragic and sad yeah that i mean and the fact that we buy into it as right. a culture that this is good and it's like no this is not good this this is the the very definition of chaos and disorder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when uh, all relationships, all of our relationships, our friendships, our relationships with our, our parents and children and grandchildren, um, the, even the ones that aren't sexual, in other words, we can, we can mess them up. We, we can um, take them for and value them for, for the wrong reasons. Um, and I think one of the blessings of this COVID time has been that most of us have had to kind of rethink our relationships a little bit because we're not just running from one person to the other to dealing with things and trying to recognize um, where we are uh, and, and with with what, what, what real love looks like. Um, and, um, uh, to, to honor the reality that every one of us needs to touch somebody else and we're, as, as friends and sexually in some way, but to honor that with, with honor, you know, I mean, with truth and, and, and um, to, the, too often 
we we race through it whatever relationship and don't honor it the way we need to in consequence yeah. do some irreparable harm which can be awful for mm -hmm. people and that mm -hmm. i mean how much of it is even latent that we don't recognize is there mm -hmm. um and that to say to to hear and to heed these words of honor your relationships with people and mm -hmm. be mindful of them. Mm -hmm. and, and our conversation makes me think about the notion of victimless crimes. And so we're, we are told that you know, there are certain crimes that are victimless, um, but in reality, all crimes have victims. And so if it's, if it's a sex worker and that, that's por pornography is the same category. Um, piracy of, of intellectual property. And so, you know, so all these things we think, well, that doesn't really hurt. That's really nobody's getting hurt when I do such and such. Well, think about it a little bit. It's like, no, someone is getting hurt. Someone is not, someone's creative work, someone's lifestyle, something, something is being compromised often because of that perceived victimless crime. Well, and of course, if we, if we are willing to make excuses and do something that even if it looks victimless we're the victims by, right. by by reducing ourselves to to something that that we're not called to live that we, as temples of the holy spirit right i i would often when we would talk about um sin or like the concept of original sin um when i was a chaplain that I would sort of create this hypothetical situation of, all right, you're you're going to the food lion and you decide that you're gonna steal a, a, a thing of Coke, right? That you, mm -hmm. you, you get caught, you realize it wasn't the right thing. So what do you have to pay to sort of atone for this, right? That do you give the store manager five bucks to say, okay, I'm paying for the cost of the, the 12 pack of soda. Do you say, okay, I'm going to give you 10 to sort of mea culpa, my fault. Um, and like, so how much do you have to pay? But then I would sort of come back and say, well, what if it's the first time anyone's ever stolen anything? Mm -hmm. That you've now introduced a concept that can't be undone. Right. Right? That, that bell that now the store manager looks at everything as a potential target for theft. Mm -hmm. And that that this person's entire worldview has just shifted um, because of something that one person did. Mm -hmm. um, my house has never been broken into, and God willing, it never will. But I've heard stories of people talk about that they can't sleep in their own homes anymore mm -hmm. because some somebody did something, and even if I don't know, they didn't steal anything, that it it shatters how we are, and that that process of healing seems to be a journey moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it changes your worldview. So it's, I mean, that's why victim, uh, victims of sex abuse um, or any kind of abuse really are you know, so hard to be healed because it's like my worldview was that, that that kind of thing could never happen. And now I know that kind of thing can happen. And so I, want, I wonder about Paul writing to the church in Corinth and saying, you know, you're creating a new way of being and that this is not, this is not what this, this life you're baptized into is all about. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move us on to our final reading from the Gospel of John. And this is at the very beginning. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. I always think of this passage in the, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. Um, and we live in a time when um, all kinds of old prejudices that I thought were on their way out have returned. And, um, and there are all kinds of new ones too. Um, and um, it's just more that disordered love thing. Um, we don't we don't get to to have good relationships with some people, but then go and see a prostitute. Oh, and by the way, I hate Muslims. And you know, I mean, uh, you can't do that kind of stuff. You, you either love your neighbor and love your God, or you don't. And and it means everybody. Um, and uh, so, so yes, something good can come out of Nazareth. God made Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think I love the line when you know, the, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it, it's it's like as as a Virginian, sometimes I make jokes about West Virginians. I have good friends from West Virginia. I do like West Virginia, but we sort of have that that geographic bias sometimes. So sometimes I hear this as one who is like, oh, you know, Nazareth was our, was our soccer team rivals, Nazareth is a place that I just don't like, you know, so it's, it's a ne'er-do-well place. But then I hear it as, as Nathaniel reading and knowing what the prophetic words are, and knowing that there is no prophecy anywhere that says um, that Nazareth is going to be the place where the, the, where the Messiah is going to come from. And so, you know, we've got, you've got Bethlehem, you've got different places that scripture says, you know, and the, and the Messiah's gonna come from here and will look like this, but, but Nazareth isn't in that. So I, I hear Nathaniel's words at first as being skeptical about that city from a, from a geographic kind of um, standpoint. Nazareth is a small town in Galilee. It's, it's, not, it's really a village at that point in time. It's really not anything um, in big. It's like, you know, it's like, Deltaville or Hartsfield. It's like sort of, it's a small place between places. Um, and, and nothing wrong with Deltaville and Hartsfield for those people who are listening to this, just trying to make a comparison here. Um, but then it, then it speaks to, here's one who has been looking expectantly for a Messiah to come along and who has read thoroughly and knows that this is something unexpected. This is something surprising. And, uh, and it makes me think, what are the ways that God comes into the world and surprises us? The, the story of Samuel being one of those, you know, a small boy hearing the word and telling Eli, you're wrong. Um, so what are the ways that God surprises us and exceeds our expectations? You know, I've been thinking on the line where Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And I would give anything to know with what tone Jesus said that. Mm -hmm. And that it seems like Jesus was just sort of waiting for him. Yeah. <laughs> like, let me open this door and let you fall straight through. Yeah. Um, and that what, what was the sarcasm? Or was there sarcasm? And if so, what was the sarcasm behind it? Mm -hmm. And that is he making fun of Nathaniel? Or is he saying, you got, you've got the eye for this? Now let's use it for something. Mm -hmm. And to, I think I could probably speculate on that for a while as to which of those Jesus was using. Yeah. yeah. And being an Episcopalian, I'd say both and. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Depends on where the accent and the syllable was. Yeah. Well, and also I love the, um, in the story, the sort of the chain reaction of things that Philip goes and finds so and so they go find. So there's a series of 
you know, community, growing community, growing community. And so we found, and, 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 and how the spirit of Jesus is there the whole time. Um, and so, you know, how, how does the, how does the one who finds Jesus share the good news that they found Jesus and how's the one receiving it secondhand receive that good news? Yeah. It seems to be saying as well that don't worry about the slander you've already said against him. He knows it and he's okay with it. Mm -hmm. He's going to call you to start walking this way anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that there's no reason to, to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Well, and that goes along with the, the, not this text, but goes on with the woman at the well. You know, he, 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 she goes and tell her friends, you know, he, he told me everything about myself and he was, he was accepting and receiving me and sent me to tell you. Three, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, it's interesting to think about Nathaniel and Thomas together, mm -hmm. the, the, there's a, the, the doubting that uh, can be enriching uh, wh while there's some prejudice here that needs to be dropped, there's also some doubting that, that, is, that I think Jesus is, is uplifting and saying, you know, the fact that you're thinking this carefully is a good thing, that you're trying to discern the truth, um, and, and I can use you. Mm -hmm. What a great takeaway. God can use us. Yeah. Well, very good, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time again this week. And uh, Gary, would you pray us out for the collect for the second Sunday after the Epiphany? Certainly will. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God now, and forever. Amen. 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 All right, gentlemen, have a great week, and uh, we'll be back next week. See you next week. <laughs>